What are some of your favorite Bible verses? I recommend you start your class this way, and if you do, perhaps someone will say Jeremiah 29, 11, and it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And perhaps someone will speak up and say, no, 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 that does not apply to us. That applies to the people of Israel there in captivity, and it does not apply to us. But I would argue that it tells us something about the heart of God, that God wants to bless you, that God God is a good, good father, that he wants to do well for you. And it tells us something about the heart of God. And then you continue to ask, what are some other favorite Bible verses? And perhaps someone will say, Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Or perhaps someone will say Romans 8, 28, a classic verse that says, we know that in all things God, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But perhaps someone will say Philippians 4, 19, and that's our key verse today, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I would recommend you spend a little time memorizing this verse today together, and you might do it by using the PowerPoint and having some of the words drop out. It's one of the things I like, love about the scripture type, or scripture memory, what that's called now. It used to be called scripture typer now, I think, but it's called the scripture memory app. It'll drop out half the, the, the words, every other word, and it'll help you to memorize those verses. Anyway, Philippians 4.19, uh, if we drop out part of the words, my God will, what does that say? My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And I want you to try to imagine, I want you to invite your people to try to imagine that you really believe that. I, I want you to try to imagine that down in your gut, down in your soul, down in that lizard brain part of you, that part of you that does not have to think, that part of you that does not have to calculate, that part of you that is the automatic part of you that just believed, that just believed deep in your soul that my God will meet all your needs. My God will meet every need I have. How would that change your life. And that's the idea that we want to explore today. So our, fa our passage is found in 1 Kings 17, beginning in verse 7, and we read, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go to at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Philip Ryken says, God must be joking, the prophet may well have thought. It was one thing to be fed by the birds, but another thing entirely to go to Sidon of all places. We learn as much as we want to know about Sidon back in 1 Kings 16.31, where the scripture says that Ahab took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, Eth Baal. Look at that name there, tell you a little bit something about her, the king of the Sidonians. Sidon was Jezebel's stomping grounds. Zarephath was on Baal's home turf. The town contained all the brazen idolatry, unholy sacrifices, and temple prostitution that went along with Baal worship. Thus, God was commanding Elijah to go down into the cesspool of sin, and, to, and not just to go there, but to dwell there, verse 9. So he went, so Elijah went, he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. I think we might say gathering some wood uh, so she can make a fire. Anyway, he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water and a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks, a little bit of wood to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, and then we may eat it and we may die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do what you have said, but first, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry. I would encourage you to get your people to say that together. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. 
for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So let's make a few observations about this. God provides, observation number one, usually God provides through the normal means of sowing and reaping. Now this is mentioned kind of lightly in this passage, but I draw this insight out of verse 14, where it says, the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. And what I see from this is that he's saying there's kind of an exception to the rule here. And the rule is that normally God's providing through the normal law of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Ecclesiastes eleven six says, sow your seed in the morning and at evening let your hands not be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well, but your job is to sow your seed in the morning and at evening. Proverbs 12, 11 says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. And Proverbs 14, 23 says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And this leads me to an important question, and the and question is this, true or false, true or false, God helps those who help themselves. Well, it's often been pointed out in many pulpits that if we're thinking about salvation, if we're thinking about having a relationship with God, if we're thinking about securing yourself in a, a, a place in heaven, then this is absolutely, totally, and completely false. God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who realize that they cannot help themselves. He helps the helpless. He helps those who know they are help, helpless. He helps those who are poor in spirit, who understand their depravity, who understand their poverty. And as it relates to salvation, this statement is absolutely and completely and categorically false. God does not help those who help themselves. But as it relates to God providing for your needs, is as it relates to God meeting all your needs, I would say this statement, generally speaking, is true. Based on all the passages we've just looked like at, I, I would say it is basically true that God is on the side of those who work hard. And normally God provides for our needs through the normal law of sowing and reaping. Observation number two, it won't look that way at times. It won't look that way at times. And our key verse is verse seven that says, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Classic book that deals with this is James Dodson's book, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And just by the way, anything that you can do to get your people to read books is gonna be in your best interest and in the best interest of them and the process of making disciples. I was reminded of this this last week. And when after I uh, quoted the passage I'm about, about to quote to you here, my uh, wife, a couple of days later, uh, said, said to me that she was rereading th this book and that she had bought a hard copy of this book to one of her friends who's going through a, a dark time th these days. And anything you can do to get your people excited about uh, reading books will be a good, good thing. I would say for me personally, I bet it's true of, of you too. The primary means, other than scripture itself, one of the primary means that God has used to grow me up has been the reading of great books. So I want to read a section from James Dobson's book, When God Doesn't Make Sense. If you have begun to slide into despondency, if you are feeling like God does not provide your needs, it is extremely important to take a new look at scripture and recognize that trials and suffering are part of the human condition. All of the biblical writers, including the giants of the faith, went through similar hardships. Let's look at the experience of Joseph, one of the great patriarchs of the Old Testament. His entire life was in shambles until the triumphal reunion with his family many years later, perhaps a dozen years later. He was hated by his brothers who considered killing him before selling him in, in, as a slave. While in Egypt, he was imprisoned falsely, accused of uh, attempting to rape Potiphar's wife and threatened with execution. There is no indication that God explained to Joseph what he was doing during those difficult years. And this is the key message of Dodson's book, because you see, we can stand anything if we have an understanding of why, but many times we don't have an understanding of why. And many times God doesn't make sense. Joseph was expected, like you and me, to live out his days one at a time in something less than complete understanding. What pleased God was Joseph's faithfulness when nothing made sense. 
Consider the account of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, our passage today. In the third verse, we learn that God is telling him to leave here, turn eastward and hide in the, in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will find from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. This was good news because there was great drought in the land. At least he would not die of thirst. But then we read in verse 7, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in, la in the land. What a strange thing to happen. Do you suppose that Elijah was thinking, You sent me here, Lord, and promised me food and water. So why do you let this brook run dry? Good question. Has the source of God's blessing in your life ever run dry? Because it, eventually it will. In this world, we will have trouble. And at some point in your life, it will look like this promise is certainly not true. Observation number three, God nearly always works through people. Our key verse coming out of the text is verse 10. So we went to Zarephath. When he came down to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And through the kindness of that widow, God provides for Elijah's needs. Reminds us of that classic preacher story of a man who's in a flood and he's on top of his roof and he cries out to God, God, save me, save me. And he has great confidence that God would save him. And somebody comes by in a rowboat and says, get in the, get in, get in the boat, uh, I'm, I'm here to rescue you. And he says, no, 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 I have cried out to my God and my God will save you. And so he went on a little while later, a, a motorboat came by and the guy in the motorboat says, get in, I've come to rescue. And he says, no, 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 I've cried out to my God and my God will save you. And he, he went off and a few minutes later a helicopter came by and dropped a rope and they cried down to him get, get grab a hold of the rope and we will save you and he says no 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 I've cried to my God and God will save me well he dies and he gets before God and he says to God God why didn't you save me and God says to him I sent a rowboat and I sent a motorboat and I sent a helicopter what more help do you need and God nearly always works through people God nearly always works through people and sometimes we want some kind of supernatural zapping we want some kind of supernatural uh, a cure when God has used the people to bring us the supply of our needs. Observation number four, God provides today's needs, today's needs, verses 14 and 15. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up, the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day, each day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. Reminds us of Exodus 16, where we read that the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little, and when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses, and they kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. And it is a visual picture of what Jesus told us to pray. And that is, he told us to pray, give us today our, what's that next word? Give us today our daily bread, our daily bread. Give us today what we need today. He told us in that same sermon, he said, do not worry about tomorrow. I know that I've got enough for today, but I tend to think that I won't have enough for tomorrow. And God says to us, give us today our daily bread. And he promises to meet our need for each day. Dale Carnegie famously said that we need to live in day-tight compartments, and it's a biblical observation. Observation number, number five, God meets our needs when we put him first. Coming out of the text itself, verse 13, we read, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do what you have said, but first, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and for your son. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. But you have to do your part first. You have to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. God will provide for you as you put him first. Going back to our key verse, Philippians 4:19, my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Let's look at the context of that verse. And going back to four, verse 14, we read, and yet it was good for you to share financially in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance, with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. 
Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more may, may be credited to your account. For I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And in this context, because you have sent this check to me, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So Elijah says to this woman, you provide for me, God's servant, and God will provide for you. And Paul says to these people, as you have provided for God's work, personified in me, as you have provided for God's work, God will provide for you. And we saw a great example in this church. I've mentioned to this guy, this couple, Jerry and Cheryl Turner, uh, son of our minister of music. And by the way, if you're looking for a, uh, an opportunity to partner with someone in missions, uh, I'd, I'd invite you to reach out to them, reach out to me, and I'll get you in, in, in contact with them. Uh, but a few months back, they mentioned that they sure would like to have a printer. And we took up, uh, actually, we just wrote, wrote them a check to, to, to buy a printer. And uh, this, this last week, they showed us a picture of the, the printer that they, they had uh, uh, purchased and Cheryl sent me this message that is a perfect illustration of what we read in this passage today. We purchased this uh, Canon Pixma. Uh, please, please let everyone know how much we appreciate the donations. We had to travel to Nairobi by public transportation and carried it uh, to the bus stop home. Not an easy task, but mission accomplished. This has a copier, scanner, printer combo. We are happy not to have to run into town on the motorcycle each time to, we need a photocopy. We will print our class books and have them spiral bound in town for 50 cents each. Jerry is busy preparing the building for classes and borders. We have a student from Ethiopia and possibly one from Cameroon. We are able to provide the school completely free of charge because of your gifts, she's saying. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. We have been praying for you and your family. Signed, Cheryl. And God is saying to us, as we put his work first, my God will supply all your needs.